Welcome back to the Paralegal Voice. My name is Tony Sepp, and I'm with my co-host, Jill Francisco. And today's guest is Karen Tushak with Spider Silk Solutions. And we will be discussing billing and the art of billing. So Karen is really a mentor of mine. And we met through a San Francisco Paralegal Association uh, event that she did. And from there, I just realized how talented she was and knowledgeable she was regarding the whole legal industry, uh, which is why I wanted to bring her on and share her with the rest of all of you um, so that she can share her knowledge. She's in Canada. It doesn't really matter. Billing is billing. Uh, so we can address those issues. So, Karen, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll jump into the topic. OK, well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this. So I have been in the legal field for more than 35 years. I was, you know, a paralegal, then a paralegal manager, then a national director of paralegals across Canada. Um, I was a president of the International Practice Management Association. Um, and just about two years ago, I decided to take the leap and go out on my own. Um, and there's really two pillars to what Spider Silk Solutions does. One is strictly on the paralegal side of it. So I do coaching to paralegals. I go into firms and help them with structure, professional development, you know, building a team that is really recognized and really promoting the role of the paralegal all around the world. Um, so that's a big side of what I do. And the other side is really technology. So I work with law firms on adopting technology. They buy the technology, they implement it but then they never really fully adopt it and get the benefits out of it. And as I see that paralegals are now really technology champions, I've gone into also that technology side of it and work with firms actually all around the world now, helping them adopt their technology and really driving it to full performance. That sounds super uh, interesting. And like I said, I'm I'm glad that you acknowledge and give paralegals the credit that, you know, we're the ones that get those attorneys on board because either A, they just don't even start it or B, they don't like change. So they don't want to, you know, learn something new or implement it. So, yeah, we always like to give our kudos to paralegals that we're the ones, you know, bringing it around or getting it all together or whatever. And then um, we're so happy to have you, like Tony said, with the billing, because I've been a paralegal for, gosh, uh, I think I'm in my 27th year and all defense. So that's my uh, billing is my deal, <laughs> you know, sink or swim. And um, I have to say, I didn't like it on day one and I still don't like it. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the show is yours to convince and help us. <laughs> No matter how experienced you are, it's uh, there, you're always like just waiting for something that can say, OK, this isn't really that bad. OK, this is really helping me. OK, this is not <laughs> making me angry at the end of every month. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the worst is going back and having to like go through your calendar, your email logs and everything at the end of the month, to try and figure out what was it that I did. Right. So lots of anxiety around time capturing. So billing has has become even more so a bigger issue post pandemic here. What are some of the things that you find come up the most when people who bill timekeepers are trying to address the billing issues within their firms? So I think part of this problem that also happened during COVID is law firms didn't know how to address that their clients were actually being productive or their employees were being productive. So they looked, especially to paralegals, at the docketing. You know, well, if you're not docketing seven, eight hours a day, then you must not be busy. When when we were internally, none of us were ever getting those hours because it also included all of our non-billable time. So it became even more at the forefront that lawyers and management were looking and saying, well, they must not be working hard or they must only be working a couple hours because, you know, forget the fact that the work was getting done. You know, they were focusing on a tangible thing that they could actually, hey, this is our KPI, how many hours do they have? So it became really at the forefront of how evaluations were being done. And it became very stressful to the paralegals because they were used to working in the way they did. And now all of a sudden, someone was questioning whether they're working all their hours because they weren't necessarily docketing for it. Or sorry, we call it in Canada docketing. So I will try and keep to time capture. One of the things I told people at the very beginning was track all of your time. So for the paralegals that were working with me, I said, it's not because I'm micromanaging. 
but you need to track all of your time, billable and non-billable, so that at the end of the year, I I can go to bat for you. I know what you've been do- doing. I know how busy you are. But there's nothing worse for a paralegal manager when you know somebody is way over capacity and then you look at their hours and it says they had four hours yesterday and trying to explain that away. So I put in the process that people should time capture for absolutely everything they do and put codes in to be able to easily parse that out. So if they were working on a new technology project, I would set up a GL code for that technology project because I also didn't want to see all their non-billable time just going into a huge bucket called admin that I, again, couldn't go to bat for them at the end of the year because I didn't know what it was that was actually in this huge bucket of 500 hours. Whereas when they parsed it out to, you know, implementing a legal entity management system or helping with an e-discovery platform or, you know, doing a professional development seminar for the lawyers, it became much easier to say, oh, like, that's all the time. And it really adds value, although there's not a monetary value to it, it adds a huge value to the firm because how else would any of this get done? So it was a change management for the paralegals, you know, and I constantly had to tell them, this is not micromanagement. This is to do well with you. Like, this is to help you. And, you know, I always tell the paralegals that work with me that I always look at them as clients of mine. Like, yes, I management. Yes, I sometimes have to deliver hard messages. But ultimately, my role as a manager is to help them achieve the best they can be and get them the technology, get them the tools, get them extra staff if we need it. And I can only do that if we all work together and I have the ammunition and the backup to make sure that I'm able to support them in that way. So that was a big change. That's a really good um, point. It was just funny because I wanted to say, I think one of the, when you're talking about creating those different codes to, to in order to give credit, you know, and know what they're spending their time on and acknowledge that. I mean, I think we used to have one that was present. <laughs> <laughs> Like it was like a 900 code and it was like present. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, you're taught, you want to talk about a general issue. That was just, you want to talk in a, in a big bucket. I mean, yeah. that was just basically you're there, maybe doing something, maybe not. You're just present. And I mean, it's like, and that's kind of funny now because I think of the work from home, you know, uh, world and it's like, okay, well, does that mean present in the <laughs> office? Does that mean present at my desk? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> That code, that code's too hard to use anymore. I can't use that code. <laughs> but no, that's great advice for paralegal. That's something really to think about. Even if you did it like kind of on your own little note thing, you know, to differentiate. Because um, sometimes you might not, you know, paralegals may not have control to implement a new code or like you said. But I mean, even just having little notes for yourself to know I was working on a project. I was working on a presentation. I was learning new software. Yeah. I was training. You know, a lot of law firms will have training codes, which are helpful. But no, that's awesome. That's great advice. I also set up a client non-billable code Mm. so that, you know, if a lawyer asked them to do stuff that they couldn't bill for, and I put in, you know, strict protocols of how to use that. So, you know, when you're entering to that code, you need to put the client's name, what, who the lawyer is and what you did for them. So yes, it's extra work, but it pays off to like fivefold at the end of the year because, I'm not going through and having to parse through every single entry and think, oh, God, what was this and what was this? And I can I get them credit for it. So it really they they did really get used to it. And it did really give like just having come out of performance management. It did really give a lot of stats that pre-COVID we never would have had because people saw them walking the halls. So they knew they were there and that was good enough for them, like the present. right? Like they're there. So that was a big one. I would say one of the hardest things to, you know, really drill in is do not self-monitor your time. So dock it how long it, or capture the time, how actual long it takes you to do the work. So, so many paralegals and law clerks that I've worked with, they're like, well, it took me three hours, but it probably, I, I think it took me longer than it should. And maybe I should, you know, capture a little less. And I always say like, like, Track everything, every moment that you do. I mean, if the lawyer thinks that it's way over the realm, then they will go to either that person or the manager and and then you can explain it away. If, 
as paralegals, we don't know what the file can handle. So by self-monitoring, we're actually keeping revenue from the firm because maybe the file can handle it and the lawyer would bill it. So it's not really up for us to discuss and think what they should be billing and what they shouldn't. And I also always say that if they people don't tell me how long it actually takes to do things, then I can't look at where do we need to build better efficiencies because I'm not seeing the real time it's taking. So, you know, if they're, if they're working in a new technology platform and it's taking them now twice as long as it used to, then it would be, you know, a flag to me to go and help and build, you know, look at the processes, look at the checklists, look at the workflows. You know, we, we need to change those because it's all about supporting the paralegals and making their lives better. Um, and the more data we have on that, the better we can help them. And the self-editing, <laughs> that happens a lot. I find that a lot of the newer people to billing tend to do that and not capture their time or consider it admin time when it's not. So I, I'm glad you addressed that particular issue as well, because it's, it's a real issue that comes up a lot. I know that the clients and the adjusters are constantly adjusting the criteria on their billing guidelines or their client guidelines, which makes it even more challenging for timekeepers to bill their time effectively. Have you run across or suggestions that you have to adjust to the adjustment of adjusters? (laughs) Fancy. (laughs) Absolutely. Because they don't want to pay for anything that they think is admin, and they want to try and wipe out all the time that they can wipe out. So a lot of it goes to the description. And, and I always tell people, like, you really need to think about what it, what it is that you're doing and write it in such a way that it shows the why and the how and the what. And, and it's not just like, I would never say, you know, telephone conversation with Tony Sip, right? Well, well like, the client's going to be like, yeah, like, why was it, you know, 0.5 for a telephone conversation. So it's always like telephone conversation with Tony Zip to review, you know, the brief that was put together to be filed tomorrow. Like, right? Like put the meaningful information in there so the client sees the value of what you've done and they want to pay for it because they understand what it is that you've done. And it's hard. Like when you're just out of school, it's really hard to know how to word it right? Like people often say to me, oh my God, I listened to how you're doing them. And like, how did you learn that? And, and I, you know, quiver when I tell them that I'm still probably the worst time capture ever, even though I speak on it all the time. I very few, often don't practice what I preach, but it's just an art. And the, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. So you, you really start to think when you're doing your doc, your time capturing, what should I say? You know, what, what was the benefit of me doing this work? And for every single thing that you're doing, you need to think that way. And then you also need to know your firm's guidelines. So most firms have guidelines and you need to know what those are. And even the simplest thing, like when I sometimes am doing um, sessions at different firms, you know, one firm will say it would be T-SIP and one firm will say it should be Tony Sip, and one firm will say it should be Mr. T. Sip, right? So you need to know your own firm's guidelines, and you need to make sure that you're adhering to them, because if not, you're going to hear from the legal assistants and the lawyers and the billing clerks when it comes time to bill that file, and everything you've done is totally out of sync with everybody else who's docketed to the file. So it really, there really is, there, there really is an art to it, right? It, it's, sure. it's really... And it's really important that, you know, people focus on it because ultimately law firms sell time. And if you're not docketing or capturing your time, you might as well not be doing the work because that's how they make money. When you were talking about, you know, like you said, the adjusters and Tony's talking about how to, you know, use the correct wording. I always tell this story to try to, when I'm helping newer paralegals, you know, we have like a, um, you know, there's always words that, you know, now the clients have computer programs to check our 
um, entries, which I think is hard because a lot of times it's not in the right context. You know, for example, we have a thing called a scheduling order that is very important, you know, court mandated uh, deadlines. And then, you know, I'll put, you know, analyzing, you know, entered scheduling order and abstracting, you know, information from same, you know, or, you know, something to that order. And uh, they'll get me for scheduling because they think I'm scheduling right. is an admin task. And I'm like, no, that's the name of the bleeding. <laughs> and so I have to go back and do it called a time frame order or, you know, something like that. So it's it's hard, I think, when uh, when you're talking about how to get our time and get our pay, you know, our substantive work uh, time for that, you know, paid. It's hard now because I said a big companies, they use those programs and, you know, you're just basically on a, you know, a search. They're searching for these words that, you know, even file, you know, it doesn't mean I'm physically putting something in the file, (laughs) you know, as an admin task. It's hard. That's hard. That's that's hard. That's a struggle, I think, for, you know, legal staff and stuff these days, because it's like you want to just put what you did because you want to be ethical and you want to be true and exact and accurate. And it's hard. It's difficult. Absolutely. It's meaningful to you, you know, and it's not even the ultimate client that's having a problem with it. It's lots of firms now are hiring third parties to run these algorithms through the accounts and they go and then they send it back to them and say, you may not want to pay this amount. So it's not like if it's the lawyer that was looking over the account or the in-house counsel, they would be fine with it. It's they're using third parties that are running through, running their, you know, systems through it and saying, oh, you could probably decrease your billing by this amount. Go back to your law firm. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 you know, technology is fabulous, but it can't show the value of what it is that people bring to the process. True. Well said. We're going to take a commercial break right now, and we will be right back with this topic of billing uh, with Karen, Jill, and myself. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry, connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high-volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. Hey, Guy, what's up? Just having some lunch, Conrad. Hey, Guy, do you see that billboard out there? Oh, you mean that guy out there in the gray suit? Yeah, the gray suit guy. Order up. There's uh, all those beautiful, rich, leather-bound books in the background. That is exactly the one. That's J.D. McGuffin at Law. He'll fight for you! I bet you he has got so many years of experience. Like decades and decades. And I bet, Guy, I bet he even went to a law school. Are you a lawyer? Do you suffer from dull marketing and a lack of positioning in a crowded legal marketplace? Sit down with Guy and Conrad for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing on the Legal Talk Network. Available wherever podcasts are found. Well, welcome back. Uh, we are here with myself, Tony Sepp, uh, Jill Francisco, and Karen Tushak. So we are going to jump right back into what we were talking about, the third-party programs that pre-screen, or pre-scrub, I guess, your billing entries. When I first started with my firm, uh, one of the things I did do is meet with the people from accounting, as well as the other people that, the paralegals as well and others that are involved with the billing process um, to find out what we could do to improve things and make it better. And that's when I found out about the semicolons. Um, You put that in (laughs) your description, you get flagged. Uh, You use the same phrase over and over again, flag. There's a lot of things that can flag you, and you spend a lot of non-billable time um, doing the appeals, the audits, that thing you did three months ago that you now have to spend 30 minutes to address. What are some of the things that you think will help people? I, I, I tend to, over the years, I've developed a cheat sheet that I send out to the paralegals that I'm like, listen, cut, paste, save. You know, these are going to be the things you're going to have to adjust it. But in general, this is what you need to say. You can't say, I asked for records. No, I have preparation of subpoena for records from blah, 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 blah. Okay. So 
any other things that uh, these third parties, they, they sent, they seem to a blessing and a curse <laughs> at the same time thoughts. <laughs> I think that there's not a lot you can do about it except try and be proactive. Um, and I don't know if it's the paralegal's role or if it's really like the lawyer and the legal assistance role, but trying to know what the retainer agreement with those clients is, because typically it's the larger clients that are using these third party vendors. And typically the larger clients, their retainer, their retainer agreement is very specific. So it will say, we won't pay for photocopying, we won't pay for filing, we won't pay for telephone calls. So if you know all of those things up front, it makes it a bit easier because you know what's going to be picked up by the third parties. You know, the problem is people will sit back and think, oh my God, docketing is, an, it's becoming a full-time job. Like I have to worry about all of this, but you know, not everybody works for the big clients and it's going to save you a lot of time at the end of the day if you do just do some planning and give some thought to it. You know, at, at the last firm I worked at, when we had a really big client and billing was coming up, they would send out an email with reminders. Like, just remember, like the client's not going to pay for this, this and this. So it was just giving you a bit of a heads up as you were doing your dockets to think about how you were wording them and what you were saying. And it, it's like writing a story, right? It's, you know, I come from, like, I did a lot of corporate work. So I always had, I was always telling my story before I did my resolutions. And it's the same thing with time capturing. You're telling your story. And, you know, even I always tell people, and it has to be fulsome, whether the lawyer's going to bill it or not, because a lot of times the account ends up being an actual marketing tool for your law firm. So they use it as, you know, if they're writing off time, they still may put those entries in and say, look at all this time we did for free or we gave you 10 percent off. But look at everything we did for that 10 percent. And the people that are looking at the account are really looking at it to say, OK, what did this firm do for me and how you write, how you stay with the protocols of the firm, how you make sure your spelling is correct, like all of that sets the tone for how professional you are. So it is a marketing tool to your clients as well about the quality and the type of work that you do for them. I, I have to agree. It's, it's it, the telling the story is telling them, the client, that you're moving the case forward. We're not just sitting on it. Reading the billing guidelines, crucial. I think every paralegal meeting I have, one of the first few things I say is read the billing guidelines. If I assign a task to you, read the billing guidelines. There's things you can and cannot do. It's like the Bible, right? So those are one of the things, telling the story, making sure that it's consistent and it's not repetitive um, because a lot of the work we do can be repetitive as well, but you're moving the case for it. So I think that's great. Jill, I know you've done this a lot, so. I know. I want to see what she has to think because like, I loved it when you said, I loved it when you said that you're, you're, you're probably the worst because you don't take your own advice. That's how I feel I am sometimes. Because believe me, this isn't the first time, you know, and probably same with Tony. This is the first time we, you know, we're we're talking about billing. We're at a, at a billing CLE, and but we still struggle because I just think it's one of those things that's just an issue. You, you don't really like it on day one. It's difficult on day one, and it, it just is kind of a thorn in your side. But I know you probably have some good advice because one of the biggest things I struggle with is, like you said, do your time. Um, as you go along, as it goes, and I know you probably use different time systems, like we use CMS and that, and, you know, and I, and I've gotten some different things like, you know, do you open up the entry? Do you, do you type something? Do you, and then you, and then you, you know, it takes you an hour. So then do you go back and edit it? You know, like what's your kind of like flow, maybe uh, tips and tricks on how you do it for the flow of it? Cause it's, that's something I think that's foreign, especially for new paralegals. And then maybe for, you know, to me personally, I feel like I'm just getting everything done. I'm busy as a little bee over here and I don't want to stop and do my time. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that that's my problem. That's what I get into. And then I think, well, that's dumb because that's how the law firm makes money. That's how I get recognition sometimes on paper because I'm doing all these tasks, but I'm just not getting them, you know, where they belong and noting them correctly. So maybe some advice on that for me and everybody else. <laughs> So the first thing I always say is there's no right or wrong way to track time. You need to do, find the method that's going to work for you and that you're going to stick with. So, you know, there's a lot of these, you know, 
Intap Time and CMS and Elite and, you know, the firms are bringing out all this new technology. But if you find it, it's a hindrance to do it that way, then you're not going to do it even more so. So I always tell people, you know, there's so many ways to dock at your time. Back to, you know, having that pad on your desk beside you and just writing it down. Some people still do it that way. Some people have a Word document open that they just type it into and then they transfer it into the accounting system towards the end of the day. Not everybody's is likes working in the accounting system because they feel then they're going back and forth where on their desk they can just jot it down. The the important thing with jotting it down on your desk is that you actually put it into the system at some point. True. So, yeah. you know, what what I try to do, and I, I even do this with just work, project work that I have, is I really use my calendar a lot. So I have a fly, five minute slot in before lunch and at the end of the day that says, check your time. Right. So I'm not letting it get to the end of the day. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, God, I've been sitting at my desk head down and I I have no hours written down anywhere. So if you just do those quick check ins, it doesn't take a lot. And you can say, oh, like, I, you know, oh, my God, why do I only have, you know, a point five and it's already noon. Right. And that way, what you've done is clear in your mind and you can just jot it down. And then I do the check in again at the end of the day. My rule is I don't go home until my dockets are in every single day. And people laugh at me because they say, yeah, that's what everybody says, but nobody does (laughs) it. And I was one of those people that I was like, uh, I was like, I was looking at my calendar and I was going through my emails and who did I speak to and what did I do today? And you're just missing so many of those point ones that it, it becomes, you know, untenuous. Like you just can't do it. So it's really, I built a system where I do. I check it before lunch and I check at the end of the day. Some people say, well, I like coming in in the morning and putting my dockets in. I typically find that when I come in in the morning, I'm my to-do list is already off track. <laughs> so if I try and do my dockets then, it's not going to happen because I come in, I get a coffee and somebody starts asking me questions, right? And then I get to my desk and, oh God, it's nine o'clock already. I better start the file work, right? So I like to do it just before I go home and then it's done and it's off my mind. If people can't follow that, it absolutely should not go longer than two days, three days. Like once you're hitting that you, you know, you started work on Monday and it's already Friday and you haven't put any of your dockets into the system, you're in bad shape. And it's not only bad shape because you're not going to track your time. We also don't always know when the lawyers are going to bill the file. So like if you're on a large transaction and you're like, okay, I'm going to put this in at the end of the transaction and then the transaction closes and the lawyer bills, well, then they can't do another bill for your time. So there's so many reasons why it's important to make sure your time is, con- in, a, in a perfect world, the lawyer would send an email and say, we're going to build this file within the next 24 hours, get your time in. Not happening. But that doesn't happen. No, not at all. It's not happening. <laughs> And you're probably on the next transaction anyway, so you can't stop. And then you're like, and then I have, I've seen it all. I was going to write a book about what people dock it, right? So people dock it for docketing. (laughs) So it's just a vicious circle, okay? Uh, You know, I had somebody put a docket in, you know, roaming the halls looking for work, right? Like it, it just, it gets to the point where it just becomes like, okay, we need to bring this back to reality and look at what exactly where you should never be docketing for docketing because you should be doing your dockets regularly. So it's taking you five or 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the day. It's not a Friday and you've just spent two hours recreating your day. And now how are you going to account for those two hours? Right. Right. So it's, it's really finding the tool that works for you, being consistent with that tool. So don't jump every time a new tool becomes available. Don't use five different tools and think I'll capture it somewhere because you're just spreading yourself thin. Find the tool that works for you and work at it. Revise it. If it's if it's not working, change it up. I love timers. So if you have the accounting system that have timers, I love starting all my timers and then I can click it on and off when someone comes into my office. So th- those are really great. But it's it's really getting into a time capture mindset because... You know, I always tell the horror story that, you know, there was an amazing paralegal who 
you know, did really good work. But, you know, in 2008, when the economy started to turn down and they were looking at dockets, she had absolutely, like, it was no time. So she had lots of admin time, but no time. So she was the one that we cut. And then after, you know, six months later, it was like, oh my God, who's doing all of this work? Like, like, because nobody knew that there was the work that was being done. So the firm was losing the revenue. She lost her job. And it was all because of bad docketing habits. So it just really is that important. And it is a, I don't think it's anything that we all have inherently in us. It's a skill that you need to learn because there's also the balance between not enough information and too much information. So you don't want to write a docket that's a page long and then have a point two, (laughs) right? Like the clients are going to think you're crazy, right? So or just padding your or padding your docket. So it's it's really it it is something that's learned and I think firms are well served if they don't just, you know, have a session with the paralegals when they start in their onboarding, but that it's it's a consistent messaging, you know, and it you know, I'm a believer that nothing should be brought up on your evaluation that you haven't heard at some time during the year. So you can't just talk to them at the end of the year in their evaluation. Well, you didn't meet your target or, well, your dockets are low or, you know, your descriptions. Like as managers, we need to stay on top of it and make sure that we're helping because we know how difficult it has been for all of us. So maybe we can impart some wisdom on the, on the newer people into the field so that they can find ways and use our expertise in making it easier for them. Totally agree. Enter and release your time daily. That's what I say. And do it as you go. Yes. Um, when you stop doing that, I used to be that guy that put it on pen and paper and then transferred, right? Then I started typing and then transferred. And then I'm like, this, this is wasting a lot of time. <laughs> if I just put it directly in, I'm done, you know? Yeah. And one of the things I do advise is that, let's say it's subpoenas, right? I already know how long it's going to take. I just put them in first and then I put the time in different facilities and then I do the task because I'm only going to get a point one. I know that. So I'm just going to plow through these eight subpoenas and have my time entries in. Because one of the things I fear, as you stated earlier, is that I don't want to lose any good people because they didn't put their time in. And there's so many good people that aren't putting their time in. It's just like, I can't, I don't know how to express more to you to please like I like you a lot as a person but if you keep doing this <laughs> I, you know we're gonna have drinks somewhere else because it's not gonna be over here you're gonna be at another <laughs> job somewhere because you know just please please help me help you you know uh, so yeah it's very very important get your time in and you often hear from the paralegals well I don't have time to dock it like I'm so busy with my work if I dock it, I'm not going to get the work done. Right. Right. So it, it it's just really like, don't bother doing it if you're not docketing for it because firm's not making any money on it. So, you know, so it, it, it really is. It's kind of like maybe I should change the name of my course to like the myths <laughs> of, do- of time capturing <laughs> and not just demystifying it because it, it is. It's it always has been like I like I said, I've been in the field for over 35 years and it's always been something that people are always struggling with. And, you know, I I teach in our college courses and, you know, we teach it in college and and all throughout. But it just becomes really difficult to figure it out. And I think, you know, the the quicker you learn the habits and actually make it a habit, the better it's going to stick with you for the rest of your career. I agree. Well, we're going to take another commercial break right now, and we'll come back with Karen and the best practices. Welcome back to the Paralegal Voice podcast. I'm here with Jill Francisco, Karen Tushak, and my name is Tony Sepp. We're going to conclude with the best practices for billing with Karen, who has done this forever and it really has some really great tips that can help um, new paralegals as well as experienced paralegals as well. So uh, let's jump in, Karen, and uh, what tips do you have to provide our paralegals in the legal community regarding billing? When you get a piece of work, ask for the matter number. Like ask right then and there so you're not wasting the time looking for it later. Right. 
right? So when the lawyer gives you a piece of work or sends something into you, find out what the number is so that you're ready to do your dockets, you know? Do your dockets daily. However you're tracking it, whatever system works best for you, make sure that it is getting into the actual formal docketing accounting system daily and that you are finalizing it and closing it out at the end of every day. And make that a habit. Um, I put notes in my calendar to remind me to do it. If you have a legal assistant, ask your legal assistant to remind you to do it. But whatever you do, make sure that you're putting the time into getting the dockets done daily so that you don't run into problems later. Make sure that you're writing clearly and legibly. So what you're writing makes sense. And remember, it's a marketing tool. And I often tell people, Remember everybody that sees your dockets. So that's why it's so important from lawyer, the lawyers you work for to the clients that you're working with to, you know, adjudicators if your bill is assessed by the client to the accounting departments. You know, every, there's so many different people that look at what you're writing for so many different reasons. So don't panic about it, but just become really good at making sure that you're writing what you need to write in a way that no matter how who sees it, it's going to really work for you. You know, break down the time so that you're not trying to find chunks later. And make sure you're capturing all those point ones. So very often, like if somebody's way of docketing is they have a piece of paper on their desk, well, then they're on the train or they're home and they're answering phone calls. That's all time you need to dock it. So you need, if you have, you know, if your firm system has a mobile app, put that mobile app on your phone so that you're tracking those point ones and point twos when you're not in the office. Because the time that you're working outside is just as important. So you have to make sure you have a mechanism to track the time that you're spending on your work when you're outside of the office. And ask, 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 you know, the paralegals that you work with, ask senior management, ask the accounting department, Never stop learning because it's such an important skill that the more we learn and there may be some quick tip or trick that somebody has that will make your life that much easier. And it's all it's important to realize that the firm makes money on the billable hour. So, you know, people are looking at how many hours you're billing. And my last tip is that the non-billable in ways is as important as the billable. So track your whole day, just get used to it. It's not that somebody doesn't trust what you're doing. It's for your own good and the good of your team, because you're going to really, it really elevates the role of the paralegal at your firm when you're able to say, look, we did, you know, we helped with diversity inclusion initiatives and we did technology implementations and we, we did a session for our clients on, you know, something that had to do with a practice group area. It really shows all the different paths and all the different things that paraprofessionals do to help their help the clients of the firm. And you're not going to be able to project any of that if you're not docketing for it and tracking it. Just to kind of add on that, not only what you're doing, like you said, the non-billable, but I always try to, because I didn't used to do this, but like if I attend a CLE on my lunch, or I take a CLA even during firm time, I put it on my timesheet because I mean, that's again, somewhere to show like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm learning. I'm, and I put, just put what it is, you know, like webinar regarding whatever. And because I mean, how our firm does it, we have to put a minimum, we have to just have on our timesheet, a minimum 7.5 hours a day. So whatever that is, if it's non-billable, if it's billable, if it, you know, whatever it is, we just have to account for 7.5 hours a day. So, you know, I work through lunch or like I said, I take a CLE or I go somewhere where, you know, and, and listen to a speaker. I mean, I put that, all that on there. And it also is a way for paralegals to keep track of their continued education, you know, to look back and verify that they're um, doing their forever learning. Because I liked it when you said that. That's, that's I'm, I'm on my soapbox about that also. So don't don't worry. That's that's a great thing to do. But no, I, I appreciate all your tips. I think they're great because it, it's a bear. And um, and I don't think, and, it, and it's harder, I think, for newer paralegals because it is a foreign skill and even you know I began teaching an intro to paralegalism class and they mention it in there and I try not very very briefly and I try to you know kind of give a little bit more background I talk about you know if you want a bill if you don't want a bill you know where you can work where you should you know should not work 
And I talk a little bit about, you know, your life in point um, six or, you know, uh, six minute increments and, you know, things like things <laughs> like that. But, you know, it's still foreign when you when you get out there and you really have to do the pen to the paper, so to speak. So I appreciate your your insight and trying to make a like I said, a task that's very, very important. Make or break paralegals, like Tony said, and, you know, uh, try to make it a little bit more bearable. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Now, Jill, you keep saying foreign. Is that because she's Canadian or is that something? That I'm- <laughs> <laughs> so Karen- I was throwing that right in there without oh. even knowing it, without even knowing it. I'm just trying to brag that we're going international. Can we do that? <laughs> Let's say that. That's great. Uh, Karen, I really, 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 really appreciate you coming down today, coming down, <laughs> being on the podcast today. I know you have some upcoming events that are really will be very helpful to our community. Would you like to, one, uh, let them know what that is, and then two, how they can get in contact with you? Sure. So first of all, I do have a podcast series that's on Apple, Spotify, anywhere you look, actually. It's called Untangling the Web. Tony was actually a guest on it. And it's, it's all things paraprofessional and technology. So I've had some great speakers. So I think it's really, it, people should definitely um, look to that. Um, I am doing a free session on April 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern time on uh, demystifying the art of time capturing. So it's it's about an hour long webinar. It's sponsored by some vendors. So that's why it's free. It's for anyone who dockets time, regardless of what jurisdiction they're in. Um, and there's a lot of fun things in it. We play Family <laughs> Feud in it. So like, who are the top people that see your time capture? Like, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, so you should fun. look at joining that. Um, my website is www.spidersilksolutions.com, and there will be a landing page on there. Or you can follow me. Uh, it will be up as of Monday. Or you can follow me on LinkedIn because they'll be there. I'll be advertising it all the time. And the only last push is I'm starting a leadership course as well on April 5th. It's done with a company that is women-led. It's called Monarch. And so a lot of it you do online or on your mobile phone. And then every two weeks, we're going to have sessions that are, we talk about things, we go through the content. I did do an International Women's Day special for $750. I'm continuing it for another week. And for all you Americans, that's really cheap because it's $750 (laughs) Canadian. So sign up. There is a landing page on my website already. So sign up. (laughs) We only have the best guests here. So Karen, thank you again for coming. Jill, I'm so happy to have you be a part of this. And for everybody else, please... Go to the websites, go attend uh, uh, seminars or webinars, and thank you for coming. I'll talk to you next time. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer 